Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kimberly Drew, and I'm a writer and independent curator. Um, and as the resident internet person in the room, I just want to encourage everyone who has a device to be live tweeting, to be posting, to be sharing, using hashtag vision and justice today. Um, it's strongly encouraged that you use your phones in this room. How cool is that? <laughs> After kicking off the convening, I had to pause and reflect upon what I wanted to say to everyone as I introduced our next panel. For those of us who are just joining or those who are tuning in via live stream, hi live stream, um, <laughs> I was watching this morning. Um, we're convening this weekend to consider the role that each of us can play in understanding the nexus of art, race, and justice. This morning, there was a stunning panel hosted by Sarah, featuring Theaster Gates and Sir David Ajay. I'd like to paraphrase Theaster. There is what we expect government to do, but then there is also a social expectation that allows harmony. It is our belief in others. Justice requires our deep commitment. In many ways, commitment is the ethos of this weekend's convening. It is the commitment of our fearless leader, Sarah Lewis. It is the commitment of her peers here at Harvard, her students, every volunteer and programming assistant that has worked tirelessly to make this possible. The success of this conference is due to our commitment to each other, and of course, our commitment to art, race, and justice. This afternoon, I'm happy to introduce our next conversation, featuring two voices who will speak about their commitment to the Turnaround Arts Program. To quote our forever first lady, Michelle Obama, <laughs> forever and ever and ever and the only one. <laughs> Arts education isn't something we add on after we've achieved other priorities like raising test scores, test scores rather, and getting kids into college. It is actually critical for achieving those priorities in the first place. That's what the Turnaround Arts Program does. Today we're joined by Damian Wetzel, the president of the Juilliard School. Mr. Wetzel has given the world so many gifts in his career as both an arts leader and as a principal dancer with the New York City Ballet and as a dancer on stages around the globe. Since retiring from his two-decade career as a dancer, he's worked as the artistic, director, excuse me, the artistic director of the Vail Dance Festival and as an independent director, choreographer, and producer. Before joining Juilliard last year, Wetzel was a director of the Aspen Institute Arts Program, which aims to further the value of arts in society. Today, Mr. Wetzel is joined by the incomparable Melody C. Barnes, chair of the Aspen Institute Forum for Community Solutions and the Op Opportunity Youth Forum. Barnes's illustrious resume includes co-founding MB Squared, a domestic strategy firm, and serving as a senior fellow and Compton visiting professor in world politics at UVA's Miller Center. She has also served as assistant to the president, the one that matters, um, and, <laughs> and director of the White House Domestic Policy Council from 2009 to 2012. And as if that wasn't enough, <laughs> in a TED talk of hers that I found, she talks about having studied piano, violin, flute, ballet, improv, and painting. Today, she is a fierce proponent of arts education's potential to change and impact minds across the nation. Before I, hand thing, excuse me, before I hand things over, I'd love to leave you with a reminder from Mr. Wetzel who said, creativity is a learning tool. It's not just decorative and beautiful. It also helps you learn and understand things. And so with that I say, happy learning everyone. And please help me welcome Damien and Melody to the stage. Hello. Great to be with you all and always to be with you, Melody. As well with you, thank you. And if I were good at any of those things, I would have had a very different career. Well, <laughs> I mean, we're gonna take a little aside right now and say they didn't uh, mention ballroom dancing because <laughs> serious business over here. Um, you know, wow, just to hear that quote from the forever first lady, uh, it, it takes us to a place of this, you know, on one level it's pure joy, another level it was, you know, the pure underpinnings of work that went on uh, during those years. And just to, to put people at ease, because this is a question I've, I've heard, Turnaround Arts still exists, uh, because uh, in the final year of the Obama administration it was transferred to the Kennedy Center, where it lives happily on, and, and we'll talk about what that means. But, uh, you know, thinking back, I keep thinking that, you know, we had, a, there was always a landscape for arts and culture in this country. Uh, there was always a landscape that uh, 
we will discuss and we'll look at images, but walking in uh, to 2009, there was something different going on. Absolutely. Um, there was a new way of thinking about the way that we were going to tackle the big challenges. I mean, I'm sure we all remember what was facing the country at that time, and we wanted to do that using every resource, every asset, the skills of every citizen to help us tackle those enormous challenges. That's right, and I think that you know, from an artist's point of view, so I grew up about 10 miles from here, I uh, went to an elementary school that uh, handed you a recorder uh, in the first grade and said, you know, this is a musical instrument. Uh, and I lived a life of incredible artistic privilege to get to try things, uh, to, to constantly have the question of like trying to do something new. It was also a time that was uh, the busing era. And so we had uh, in my school students arriving from all parts of Boston. Uh, who joined with us in these endeavors that uh, were all about possibility. And that's what I keep thinking of. And that the underpinnings of what we're going to talk about here um, were not just uh, happy and like for the good of it all. Yes, the creative part is all about process and having a chance to think differently, to ask questions that have a resolution, but it was also about work like the chance to do the hard work like Winton talked about this morning, uh, and the opportunity to have the framework. Um, so I think about that a lot when I think about that period of time that you know, there were a lot of us doing different types of artistic endeavors, citizen artist work we call it, like the idea that being an artist is equated and, uh, with being a part of your society, about, of your community. But a lot of it as, uh, was done in the face of opposition to the structure as opposed to enhanced by the structures that existed. Right, and, and to put our conversation and our discussion about turnaround arts in context, we, we think about education. I mean, going back historically, we think about the African American story in America, that it was one of struggle, mm -hmm. but also one of striving and one of excellence. And simultaneously, the American narrative, the American focus on education um, was one that was much more challenging. The policies, the practices, you think about periods where it was illegal in some places for African Americans to learn to read. You think about the fact that there were places where entire school districts were shut down to avoid African American children and white children going to school together where resources weren't provided, there was underinvestment and certainly disinvestment, and even when we got to periods of reform, that there was such monumental resistance, and we are sitting in a place, in a city, where we can think about those images of resistance and the anger and the hostility. And so as all that was going on, we also created these narratives and these images in the psyche of America that are indelibly on our minds about what was possible, that children can't learn or won't learn or didn't deserve to learn. And all of that was in the background as we were walking into the White House in 2009 and thinking about not only an economic challenge, but the totality of that challenge that included how were we going to approach the challenges facing American education and the American education system. Right, and I think that, you know, the, 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 what was in the water right at that moment had started, uh, you know, with the campaign, with an actual arts policy committee uh, as a plank of the platform uh, that I was privileged to be on, Sarah was on, uh, and it laid out the idea that art and artists were not a decorative force, they were a productive part of society, to be subsumed and part of the onward struggle that we were all putting our shoulders to. And it validated, and it was the first time in that way that I think that had ever been done, certainly on a presidential level, in a serious way, that this actually matters, and central to that was education. And the goals were all about providing the opportunity to be a part of the solutions. Uh, and so we, we had that energy going into, the, into 2009, um, and we sort of built, built from there. Uh, I'm going to 
say this is what you know confronted us in some ways uh, <laughs> when we thought about where we were coming from. That it was, uh, as Sarah also said earlier, you know, not, not everybody counted. Not everybody counted in anything. And when we thought about opportunity, and in terms of educational opportunity, uh, we knew the work that was there to be done and remains to be done. And we wanted to find our way to being productive in it. Uh, part of that, a big part of that, it seemed apparent uh, right from the start, was who counted was who was seen. Uh, and I remember sitting in the front row in the East Room, and I snapped that photo, and I actually texted it to Sarah because of, I knew her work as it was developing. And the idea that this was our amazing president, full of grace, standing, giving awards for arts and humanities, uh, was just everything about what was possible. Right, and you look at that and you think about the arc of history and all that had happened between the man behind the man who was the 44th president of the United States and the struggle and this new moment, this new moment of possibility and opportunity. That's right, and, and so much of that in those very, very beginning years in 2009, 2010, uh, what happened was the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities, uh, which had existed for over two decades, suddenly was populated by artists. Uh, and it was a revelation, right? <laughs> uh, and we set about trying to figure out what we could do, where we could have impact. We had working groups on economic development, working groups on diplomacy, working groups on uh, education, uh, working groups on the idea of, a, of an artist core. Uh, and within that time period, though, the work of celebrating all voices was going at a fever pitch. Uh, events that celebrated our sheroes and heroes, and there's Judith Jamison being celebrated at the White House by our forever First Lady. Uh, and it wasn't just about the, the excellence of Judy's craft as a dancer and as a director and as a leader for this country. It was about how she was training and bringing up students. So yeah, we populated the East Room with students from all around the country to partake in what that meant to be educated and to, to, to look at someone like that and realize the possibilities that were apparent for everyone. And understand that before, and I still call them FLOTUS and POTUS, walked into the White House. They were thinking very seriously about the role that the arts could play. They wanted to engage artists and the artist community in a fundamentally different way, that it wouldn't, it would be performance, yes, but not just performance. What could the artists that walked into the East Ring of the White House tell us about who we are and how we celebrate ourselves and what was possible? That was fundamental from the very, very beginning. Well, and as, as an artist who had that uh, opportunity to be there, that's exactly what it felt like. And it felt like a challenge. Uh, in fact, I do remember the president when, you know, the first time we had a, an opportunity to meet him uh, as a committee, he said, bring me something. He said, bring me something. You know, we, we know you can, you can challenge us to do better. Uh, and, you know, this is next slide I, I subtitled, and it wasn't just kids dancing. Uh, they embodied grace in the White House in so many ways that were informative to the artistic community uh, and, and for, again, for all voices to be amplified. Uh, they continued traditions of celebrating good work, but with an emphasis on community programs that developed opportunities for all voices to develop artistically. Uh, I chose a little triptych here. This is uh, the First Lady. Uh, with the new ballet ensemble, that's Brianna, who was representing the students, and Katie Smythe, who created the program in Memphis, Tennessee. I loved this photo of Brianna on the hallway, looking at the First Lady with Stevie Wonder and saying, you know, I'm here too. I have this possibility. And then this is a photo of Brianna, and the gentleman in the middle is a guy named Lil Buck, who's a dancer, who I've worked with a lot over the last decade. And Little Buck's a product of the New Ballet Ensemble. He came out of Memphis. He came to the White House to celebrate the program that developed him. Uh, and I loved that kind of idea that this was a celebration. And that was the background by which all the kind of work on what are we going to do 
was being done. Right, and as you all were thinking through those issues, the policy staff was thinking about economic crisis and the economy almost going over a cliff. We were thinking about what to do about the financial services industry. We were thinking about all of these issues, including what the president had said. You remember that campaign, he talked from the beginning about the importance of education. Pre preschool, K-12, higher education, post-secondary education, and the challenges that face the country, going back to that narrative arc that I talked about a few minutes ago. And he was saying to us, how are we going to tackle these issues? Even before we walked into the White House on that January day, January 20th, he was, we were working during the transition to try and craft and to shape policies that would start to shift what was happening in schools across the country. So those two things were all happening at the same time. Right, and as the, as the, as the time passed forward, and we've seen this image earlier today, it was intrinsic was the idea of representation, of representational justice, that this was a first family in the White House that was, was open, the doors were open, and young people can gaze upon them and always will from now on with aspiration, but a recognition of their own possibility. Right, so the country was being now, from my perspective, pleasantly bombarded with all of these images of a new first lady and a new president. And we've talked over the course of today and yesterday about the way, in, and I think Carrie Mae Weems was talking about this, the way that some of those images um, exacerbated friction and anger and violence in many places, but at the same time for others, for these young people and so many others, this was a chance to imagine what I could be. Mm -hmm. What could I be? And for many of them, they were the only images that they ever had. I remember introducing my godson and his little brother to the president. My, his little brother was eight years old at the time. He turned to walk into the Oval Office and the president was standing there leaning against the door and Ryan turned the corner and he looked at him and he goes, oh my God. <laughs> he was eight years old. I mean, that was a sense of aspiration and possibility and opportunity rolled into those three words. So, meanwhile, things were happening that had really, you know, un unprecedented things. This is a photo uh, of a meeting uh, where we unveiled for the president uh, a landmark report on arts education. So over those first two and a half years, we did the, the research was done on the state of arts education and the state of possibility that this administration could look at and try and make progress on through the arts for education. Uh, you can see Melody. Uh, <laughs> Different hair. Standing I on the side. I love we can do so many things with our hair. Uh, <laughs> and shepherding this process where, you know, uh, I'm trying to look real serious down the end. Uh, Kerry Washington's dead center across from the president. Standing there, all of us putting our shoulders to the wheel saying, we want to make a difference. We want arts to, to be a part of this solution. And, and understand for a second, historically, art sat in the East Wing and policy sat in the West Wing, and never the twain shall meet. And the very idea, and I remember a colleague saying to me, so you've got artists working with you on education policy? It was like, absolutely. I mean, the idea of integrating the power of these communities and all of these big brains and expertise and talent to take on what, again, I mentioned was one of the president's signature priorities and the fact that he had also said to us, we want to focus on the 5,000 schools in the United States with, that were the lowest performing schools, the bottom 5% in addition to the other work that we were doing. Those were the schools that had the most significant rates of uh, disciplinary action taking place, and we know what that means. Those were the schools where attendance was often the lowest. Those were the schools where you had the most significant numbers of students that were dropping out, where students were reading significantly below grade level, significantly below grade level. So how were we going to work together to turn around those schools? And the answer was, what you're seeing to some degree. There was certainly an element in some ways of star search, we were laughing about that, mm -hmm. like the idea that you know this was the work was going on 
it was, it was about drawing attention in that way to the important work that was being done. And the strategies that were being employed all had to do with resources about new arts teachers, instruments, possibilities for the students to actually try, just like I was handed a recorder. But, to, but more than that, it was driven by data, it was driven by uh, research in how these, these programs could develop. Uh, and it started with eight schools around the country as pilots, and well, you'll get to the, the statistics, but the short answer was it proved to work. Uh, the students themselves understood something about what it meant to perform, is the way I always look at it. Culminating events were pivotal. There were ideas that there was an end game. There was a moment when you had to stand and actually deliver, and you had to be a part of something in a real sense. And my own experience in classrooms was always about the, the eyes in the students. When their eyes lit and they finally were able to actually engage in the possibility that they would perform, that was the moment when we knew that we were making success. Right, and all of that was consistent. Damien mentioned the data. Um, all of that was consistent with what we had learned, what we felt, but what we learned and knew to be true, that we were developing and supporting a whole host of skills in students that would allow them to become uh, more proficient at reading, to attach to schools in a different way, that stickiness that would bring them there. Um, we knew that, that what they would learn in arts programs not only would help them build confidence and discipline, but also could help them with math and with science. Um, so there was the performative piece of this for them um, that was so important and helped to build other skills that we knew could translate um, into their ability not only uh, to learn, but to, to attach to school and attach to education in an important way. That's right, and it went on in different ways. This is uh, uh, Savoy Elementary. This is Orchard Gardens, not far from here. Roxbury, and Orchard Gardens is an amazing success story of a school where the principal uh, fired his security guards and hired more arts teachers. And uh, when you, uh, when you, and I can imagine there were those who shook their heads and went, this is, you know, not going to work, but it was, the, it's a place where you open the door and you're in an oasis of light. Uh, what Darren said this morning, we need, we need light. It's a place of light, as you can see when you open that door. Uh, there's Little Buck, so you saw him earlier, celebrating where he came from, celebrating his school, and this is him uh, at a school in Detroit. There he is at Inner City Arts. The first time I actually uh, I met Little Buck was at Inner City Arts uh, to teach those students, uh, me and Yo-Yo and Little Buck, bringing the light. Lame Deer, Montana, seat of the Northern Cheyenne Nation. This definitely goes with some sort of caption of, please try this with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> please. <laughs> but they also later on that, that same day were working with instruments provided to them by the Turnaround Arts Program, preparing for a community event that brought their parents, brought community tribal leaders, together because that was all a part of this, that the idea that it doesn't happen in isolation from the community. This is a program that I wanted to share with you because it, it speaks to something that you, know, you just can't predict. Uh, as part of Turnaround Arts, uh, we were able to bring together three schools, the, the Lame Deer Montana School, Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Orchard Gardens to New York to do a project on the High Line photography project where each student was given a camera in two hours in addition to a history lesson and some other more rigorous work and sent out to take photos for two hours. Then they had to come back and curate that down to a presentation of three to five pictures and, and uh, present. Uh, actually very hard uh, in a day of digital photography when you take a thousand photos. So this was a photo done by uh, Starissa from Lame Deer and it was followed up with a poetry project with C.C. Longknife, who wrote this poem about that photo. There's a dark side looking at the bright side, waiting to be one, uh, wanting to be one, and she later on recited that at the White House um, for the First Lady. Uh, this was the kind of thing that we, we couldn't have even anticipated, how things build on each other. Once you start, there's always a next step, and that was just thrilling to get to do. 
That led to the National Student Poets Program, Forever First Lady hosting yet again with the young poets from around the country. And that led to other partnership activities with amazing people. Last summer in Aspen, Ava meeting with the young poets and talking with them about their possibilities. Heroes like, like Yo-Yo, working in schools, but also part of an overall ethic, which led him to the border just a few weeks ago. And to a school in Detroit, with young Sterling Elliott, who's now sophomore at Juilliard. <laughs> and, uh, Winner, winner of the Sphinx competition for excellence in classical music just this past March. Um, so all of this was a part of like pushing forward, but it had this underpinning, uh, I keep coming back to it, of, of it doesn't happen just on its own. It was, right. Yeah. right, it was the integration and the, uh, and the knowledge that we could bring arts together and artists as citizen artists working with us um, on policy to address these significant challenges. So Damien mentioned we started in eight schools. Um, we were in Iowa, Montana, New Orleans, uh, Massachusetts. And over time, because we wanted to better understand what we were doing and what was working and what didn't, and to test the proposition that we so deeply believed in. And over a three or four year period, uh, we collected information based on what we were doing. And we found out at the end of that period we looked at the results and what we found was what we had hoped for, that students were reading better, they were engaged in math and performing in math better, that attendance was up, and also the disciplinary problems were down. And I'm not talking about small, slight changes. I'm talking about significant changes. And when you compared the schools where, there were, where turnaround arts was present and those artists were there to other schools that were getting additional resources, to other schools in the district that weren't getting those resources, you could see significant improvement. And that led us to believe that it was important to scale what we were doing. And that's what policy also allows us to do. So what started out as eight schools, now we're serving 57,000 students. Um, we are working in 79 different uh, schools, and we are working in 17 different states in the District of Columbia. But we also recognize, because at the end of every administration, things change. We didn't know who was going to sit in the White House next. We really did not know who was going to be sitting in the White House next. Um, but to prepare for that, there was also our resolve to find a permanent home for turnaround arts. And that's when the Kennedy Center um, accepted the call. And that is where turnaround art sits now. And so it is permanent, it's got a home, it has resources, it has support that allows for the scaling that I just described, something that we know works, something that we know can be such a powerful force in the life of young people and to fulfill and to meet those aspirations that they have for themselves, whether it is to be like so many of you in this room who have um, incredible artistic talent or someone who wishes that she did but keeps trying, um, or whether they choose to be scientists or engineers or teachers or doctors or lawyers or whatever it is that they choose to be. Yeah, I think that that, uh, that it, it, and it never happens in a vacuum. It was with partners. Um, I'm thinking about the Ford Foundation specifically, thinking about companies like Crayola, Music National Association, music merchants all coming together in the belief that this was work that actually mattered, that it really was work. Uh, and the rigor factor, that this was hard and meant to be hard, and we do it because it was hard. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the, the, the work that matters, that it wasn't decorative, was implicit from the very beginning. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, under, undervalued that idea in society in general, I think that's led to a, a lack of prioritization for the arts uh, as an educational force, uh, but this was a step to, to fight that and it's uh, so gratifying to see that it goes on. Right, and this idea that, as you were saying, not just decorative in a place, when you think about arts and their place 
in the White House, um, an evolution that's also taken place there. All right. So this was uh, John F. Kennedy's administration welcoming great cellist of the day, Pablo Casals, to play, which is an archetype of musical excellence, certainly, uh, for, for some. But it was also, as you can imagine, a pretty elite room. <laughs> yes. Everybody wasn't in that room. That's right, for some, that's right. right. Uh, and then you have this, uh, which was the culminating event as we did in the White House at the end of each year, bringing the students from around the country to compete in uh, the White House talent show, where everybody wins. Uh, they performed. And they, uh, they, they performed. <laughs> And they celebrated with the First Lady, and this one's captioned, oh my God. Because. Because <laughs> somebody was arriving. And you know, the value of that imprimatur is just unbelievable. Whatever school I went to had a seal, President's Committee on Arts and Humanity, on their door where they go in when they're late, <laughs> be sitting right there, and they'd say, you know, uh, we have the backing of the President of the United States for what we're doing in this school. Uh, and it meant so much uh, to, to the idea, but also, again, to the work. Um, it came from this. That's what, that's what launched it. What didn't happen, didn't skip this step. Uh, it was artists like Alfre Woodard, so many others now who've joined in this. But not just there. Not just there but there. Right there, too. And in partnership always with the schools themselves, with the faculty, with providing professional development tools, providing resources, providing you know, an annual summer conference to develop the skills and to share the knowledge, the best practices that were going into the work year after year after year. I just got my invitation to the next one that's coming. Yeah. Uh, we're all and the coaching that took place. And the idea, I mean, we know teachers already have so much um, that they have to do in a classroom, that this would be additive, that this would be supportive um, of the work that they were already doing in the classroom um, and not seen as or felt as a burden. That's right. I mean, it literally was all about how do we feed into this, this possibility for these kids uh, so that they can, uh, you know, really reach all the way. And yeah. uh, that's, our, that's our last slide. I think, you know, I'd love to say that revisiting this, you know, this, these images uh, is particularly, you know, poignant in some way for me because of uh, the fact that it lives on. And we know this is going on right now in those schools, right as we're meeting here today, that this work is going on. Uh, but also in the intervening time uh, since uh, 2016, uh, I now am the president of Juilliard. Uh, and the idea that that is a opportunity of width as well, of broadening of opportunity and voices. And uh, I, I want to tell you a short story that you know, Sarah came to visit last fall at Juilliard, and she did a little module, the class I teach on arts and society, uh, and talked to the students about vision and justice and the idea and how it related to their path. And it was a room of about 40 actors, dancers, and musicians. Uh, and watching their recognition of their own place in it was, was so important for me to see how these young artists who are so driven in so many ways, come to Juilliard, you have to be pretty driven, you're going on a path, but then to realize the sheer scope and the scale of what, what it was about, uh, to, be a, to be an artist in society. Uh, and later on, uh, one of the students wrote a story about her grandmother uh, who went to Juilliard as a pianist in the 1940s uh, and dedicated it to Sarah to say, you know, that this kind of representation is what we all need to see, the invisible visible, uh, and ins inspired so many uh, people around the school to see that work that you did, uh, Sarah. And it's just such a thrill to get to be here, uh, to partake in it and to build off of it. Uh, and the, the stories that matter need to be told. We need, her name is Julia Warren, Jules Warren, and her grandmother was also Julia Warren. 
and that is a part of Juilliard's history that we're going to be telling more and more. Uh, I discovered two weeks ago that Clarence Jones studied at Juilliard. If you know who Clarence Jones was, is a lawyer for Dr. Martin Luther King, speechwriter, incredible uh, human, and incredible clarinet player as well. Uh, this is a part of our history too, that we always have to show the, the range that everybody does count and everybody does get a chance to participate. Right. And the reality, and he is the embodiment of this, but that artists play such an important role. They are not just wanted, but desperately needed if we are to achieve equity and social justice and the society, the globe, that we aspire to. That's right, and to think of it as always a process, that its creativity is in fact the key to thinking. We heard earlier about it's asking a question. It is asking a better question. It's saying what can we do together that we can't do alone? And how can we be creative in a true sense at everything we do, that these children deserve that opportunity, that light, as Darren said, to open that light. So, so, so thank you. Thank, thank you for the work that you've done.